All right, folks, so we're gonna do a little recap here for episodes four and five this time. I missed last week because I was out of town, but we're back on schedule and there's a lot of stuff to go over. The big thing that happened on episode four in my mind is that uh, both Benji and Terry both got beavers, which is huge. Uh, there's lots of meat on a beaver. Uh, lots of fat and we see later on uh, Benji was uh, rendering out the beaver fat and he had a, a burn bowl that he had made out of a log and he had that thing full of rendered beaver fat. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that here in just a sec. Um, but the weather is still warm and we see that Benji is cutting his meat into strips. He makes a smoker, um, just a very simple tripod smoker with a rack in there. He covers it all with boughs. Uh, which is a great way to do it if you don't have to worry about a grizzly bear coming and taking it. Um, I would imagine he has that, sh that smoker pretty close to his shelter so that he can keep an eye on it in case a black bear comes out. So beaver are aquatic animals. They spend the majority of their life in water and one of the common characteristics of aquatic animals like that is typically they have aquatic mammals anyway, uh, they typically have a large percentage of body fat. And in a survival situation, that is absolute gold out there. Now, Benji talks about rendering that fat. Um, that's something that when the weather's warm like this, you've got to render your fat to make it, uh, to get it into a form where it's going to keep long term. And so the way that you do that is you take your pot, you cut the fat into chunks, and you put that pot over a, a low heat, and you put the fat in there, and the fat will melt out of the membrane that it's encased in. When you do that, you end up with a pure either tallow or an oil, depending on what kind of an animal it comes from, um, and all of the moisture is gone from that fat. Once it's in that state, that stuff will keep indefinitely. I've got some deer tallow that I've rendered out. It's been in a mason jar, no lid, no refrigeration, no anything. It's been in my shop for like 10 years. It's just as good as the day that I rendered it out. That stuff has a shelf life of who knows how long. Now, the beaver fat, we see Benji, it's kind of soft. It's more like a pork fat, which just doesn't solidify. Uh, rather than like for my deer that I had on season eight, once you render deer or elk or moose or something like that down, it's like, it's tallow. It's really hard, almost like a bar of soap. But the point is, once it's rendered out, if you have a place to keep it, uh, that stuff will keep forever. Rendering is very important when the weather's warm. All right, so let's talk a little bit about snaring. Uh, we see in episode four and five that there's several folks setting snares. Uh, Timogen uh, shows him making a, a, a spring pole snare for squirrels and baiting it with um, the small immature cones, uh, spruce cones that the, the squirrels are cutting out of the trees. And then in episode five, we see that Tom's out look, uh, setting snares for rabbits. Now, I don't know what went into their decisions to make spring pole snares versus just regular static, uh, like a rabbit snare, or one technique that works really well for squirrels is a squirrel pole. Um, squirrels have a habit of using the same travel routes over and over and over again. And once you figure out what those travel routes are, um, you can set snares along there and like we saw Jesse have some uh, some success in maybe episode three I think it was those are much easier and quicker to make so spring pole snares are a lot more work than just setting a static snare but there's a couple of uh, there's a couple of situations where you might want to do that one is if you've got a situation where you've got snares that are being robbed by some ground dwelling animal, foxes, raccoons, whatever that may be, and you need to get that animal up off the ground um, and away from that animal. That's one reason to set a spring, a spring pole snare. The other situation where it might make sense to, to make a spring pole snare or a lifting type of snare is in a baited type set. So Typically, when you make a static 
snare set, uh, you would make it on a trail. It'd make, it'd make a, a trail set. So there's not an attractant there to bring that animal in. You're just relying on setting those snares in that animal's normal travel routes. With a baited set, uh, you're relying on bringing that animal in, having it grab a bait, and in that type of situation, you can set the snare such that the animal goes through the snare, grabs the bait, pulls it, sets off the trigger, and up the snare goes. And that seems to be what Timogen was doing with the, uh, the immature spruce cones. So I'm not sure if Timogen is, is setting static snares or not. Uh, he pr I would imagine that he probably is, and we're just not seeing it. So there's a lot of different ways to do a springs pole snare or a lifting type of snare for those two different situations. Uh, and that may be something that I'll cover in a future video, but if you wanna see something like that, uh, let me know in the comments. And if there's a lot of interest in it, I'll go ahead and cover those things. All right, so let's talk about shelters. Um, there's a couple of things that are going on in four and five um, to discuss here. And one of them is Igor's log cabin. Uh, this is something that, that gives him a lot of trouble. Um, and he, you know, he just kind of got in over his head a little bit on that cabin, or that's the, the, the impression that I get. And he talks a little bit about that, about wondering if he should scrap that idea and go with something like a, uh, an A-frame shelter. <sighs> It's hard to make that call. It's easy to make that call from the outside. It's hard to make that call while you're actually in there because you feel like you've already got a lot of energy sunk into that and you feel like you need to press forward. Now, from the outside, from my perspective looking in, he could have pivoted from that shelter and just had a raised wall A-frame. He, he could have pivoted to an A-frame. Um, and saved himself some energy. So to build a, a cabin like that is a tremendous, tremendous uh, caloric expenditure. And it's hard to tell from the edit really what's going on with anything, um, let alone specifically what someone is able to catch or trap uh, or forage on their landscape to actually fuel themselves. So it appears like Igor is having a hard time finding enough food to keep himself fueled to make it through this project and ends up calling it quits uh, before he experiences any long-term detrimental impacts to his, uh, to his health. So the other big shelter project that we've got going on uh, this season is Jessie's wilderness mansion that she's making out there. Uh, she's putting a lot of effort and a lot of energy into this thing, uh, but she's making some good progress. And it's gonna be interesting to see how this shelter progresses uh, as the season goes on and then whether it's going to be worth it or not in the end to put that much energy into a shelter. Uh, and the last shelter I want to talk about is Tom. Tom looks like he's got a really good shelter going and the fireplace that he makes with the clay and the river rock is stellar looking. It looks like it works really, really well. It looks absolutely amazing. Um, and so that's going to be nice. And one of the things that you're going to notice about Tom's fireplace is it's inside his shelter. And so he's gonna get a lot of, uh, he's got a lot of thermal mass in that stone and he's gonna get a lot of benefit of, as that stone heats up when he's got a fire in there, it's just gonna continually release that heat through the night as his fire burns down. Now on my season, I got a lot of questions afterwards about why I put my fireplace outside my shelter versus inside. And the main reason there is because I did not have clay. I didn't have the clay to work with that these guys on this season have. The mud that I had to work with was very sandy and so it didn't make very good shinking. And so I put my fireplace outside because I didn't feel like I could seal it up well enough to keep it from smoking up my shelter. Um, and so putting it on the outside was what I felt to be my best option for uh, kind of the best of both worlds. Um, having a fireplace and a place to cook, I knew that I was gonna lose some of that benefit from the radiant heat from the stone, but I also didn't wanna have to be battling uh, a smoky shelter the whole time. Now the main point that I want to make, and, and the shelters give a good opportunity to make this point, 
Uh, Igor gets out there and he discovers that it is a hell of a lot of work and it takes much longer than you think. Um, and I, I don't know, this is pure speculation. I haven't talked to Igor about this, um, but it seems to me like this is, this may be the first time that he's tried this in a wilderness setting. And that's the point that I want to make is anybody that's going into season 10, you need to go out there in the woods. You need to take the tools that you're going to have and build some shelters. You know that you're going to have a tarp and I, I can't remember what the dimensions on the tarp are 10 by 16 or something like that. Go get a cheap 10 by 16 tarp, go into the woods with your ax, your saw, whatever you're going to have and build a couple of different configurations of this shelter. Cut all the poles that you're going to need. If you're going to do a bow roof, cut all the boughs that you're going to need. Spend, you know, three, four, five, six, eight days or whatever doing this because you're going to learn what you can do in a, in a, a limited amount of time. You're going to, you're going to figure out how long it's going to take you. Um, and that goes for all the skills that you're going to need. You know, if you're planning on making a gill net with, uh, the inner cores of your paracord, strip the cores out of your paracord, make a gill net, practice the skills that you think you are going to need when you're out there. I cannot stress that enough. Go do it. Uh, a theoretical knowledge is not going to get you through this challenge. You need to have gone through these things and worked out the bugs before you get out there because once you're dropped off on your site, you have limited time, you have limited calories. Figure those things out when you don't have limited time or limited calories. You need to have that stuff worked out in your mind. Now with that said, when you're dropped off out there, things are always going to be different. You're not going to have the same materials that you have, you know, wherever you live. That's not what is, that's not what's important. The important thing is that you go out there with a practical working knowledge and experience from having done these things previously. All right. So I just want to briefly talk about uh, the hunting and fishing that we're seeing with these guys on this season. This is something that I am very, very happy to see. They've put these guys in a place where they have multiple routes to success. And this is something that Jordan had talked about on, on his channel, I think last year. Um, but the difference between uh, Chilco Lake, British Columbia is there was there were basically only two paths to success there. One was to get big game and two was to be very big going in. Either one of those ways could have won it in season eight. On uh, season six, seven, and nine, there are multiple paths to success. One, you could go in very big and just starve it out. You could do it through fishing, it seems, or uh, you could do it through, it seems that you could do it through small game perhaps, or you can kill a bear. Um, so you've got multiple paths to success and that just makes, in my opinion, makes for a more interesting uh, season because you get to see different strategies uh, and people going about things differently. All right, so let's talk about water uh, and processing water or not processing water as the case may be. So Juan Pablo, there's a segment in uh, episode five where he's talking about just dipping water straight out of the river and, and drinking it and how much time and energy he's saving uh, doing that. Now, that is, that's exactly what I did on, uh, on season eight. I was drinking straight out of the lake. I never boiled any water except for making tea. Um, and that's just to make tea. I, didn't, I wasn't worried about getting any kind of uh, sickness from that lake. Uh, but there's a couple of big differences between Chilco Lake and Labrador where these guys are. Chilco was your high elevation, the glaciers are right there, and that entire place is basically a huge bowl of pure glacial meltwater. And so I had zero concerns with any kind of pathogens in that water, never had, uh, I never had any issues with it, and no one else on our season had any kind of, as far as I know, any kind of um, problems with, with drinking water. Some people were boiling water, some people weren't. I thought that was just a complete waste of time on our season. Um, 
Labrador is a, a little bit different because you have an area, it's a, it's low elevation. Um, you've got a lot of meadowy type habitat. Uh, you've got multiple animals that are living in the water. You got seals, you got uh, beavers and things like that. Cryptosporidium and Giardia are the uh, beavers will host that and so if you're getting your water out of a meadow type system uh, Giardia especially and Cryptosporidium both can be problems and if you get that and we're going to talk about this here in a minute if you get Giardia out there guys it's gonna it's gonna wreck you with that said I completely agree with what Juan Pablo said because contrary to popular belief Drinking raw water in a wilderness setting is actually pretty doggone safe if, if you know where to get your water and you take some precautions. So as I said, you don't want to get your water out of a beaver pond. That's bad news. Don't do that. Uh, you don't want to get your water anywhere downstream of a beaver pond or anywhere that's like a meadowy type system. Uh, you want to find ideally if you can you want to find a spring that's coming up out of the ground uh, you want to go up in elevation and try to get above as much of that inflow to the streams as you can get um, if you have a lake type type system a lot of times uh, that those cryptosporidium uh, cysts and things like that they will sink to the bottom and so you can go out into the lake uh, get some of the water from the the top strata of that lake and it's uh, most of the time going to be fine or like Juan Pablo says getting it out from the main part of the river uh, is much safer than just dipping it out of a uh, of a stream I'm gonna talk about some of those waterborne illnesses here at the end because I've actually had Giardia before and it at it it sucks and so in a backcountry or wilderness setting uh, water is a very important consideration and so that might be a, a good topic for a future video um, covering things like where to find good water, uh, how to assess how safe it is to drink, uh, when to make that call on whether to just drink it raw or to process it or filter it or whatever, and maybe some different methods for doing that. Future video, let me know if you wanna see it. All right, and so for episode five, the big thing here is sickness. Um, I hated to see this. I really hated to see this, but Benji ended up uh, going home at the end of episode five because he got something out there uh, and he was vomiting, diarrhea, body aches, cramps. Um, you know, there's a number of things out there that can make you sick. Uh, we've already talked about cryptosporidium and giardia. So giardia is actually a parasite and it is transferred through fecal matter. Beavers will carry it, um, humans carry it and transmit it, and it's primarily a waterborne illness. I've had Giardia and it will make you wish you were dead. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's terrible, terrible. Pounding headaches, uh, body aches, fevers, chills, severe severe abdominal cramps um, vomiting diarrhea which leads to dehydration and you cannot keep anything down you can't even keep water down um, when i had it it lasted almost three weeks i lost probably 10 pounds just and i'm, I'm i was here at my home um, you are incapable of doing anything when you have that stuff i mean you're basically laying in bed or you're in the bathroom. That's the only two things that you're, you can do. So Cryptosporidium is also a parasite. It's got a, a little bit different life cycle than Giardia does, but it's got very similar symptoms. And I've never had uh, Crypto, but from what I can tell, it's got a similar duration, uh, but perhaps slightly less. So one to two weeks for Cryptosporidium. Again, that's not something that you want in the, uh, in the woods. So beavers can host uh, Giardia for sure, and I think they can host Crypto. Uh, I'm not positive on that, but there's a pretty good chance of it. Uh, they can also carry Tularemia, and Tularemia is something that we've heard talked about on previous seasons. It's something that's carried by rabbits. Typically not a problem later in the season because the rabbits that have um, Tularemia typically 
tend to die off when the weather gets cold. So both Adam and Benji get sick on uh, episode five. Adam gets over it. Unfortunately, Benji doesn't, which is, I, I really hated to see that because Benji is one of the most competent outdoorsmen that I've ever met. So Benji was boiling his water and I, I feel like he was pretty safe there. You know, this could have been uh, perhaps some fecal contamination uh, from messing with the hide or doing whatever. And oftentimes, uh, Giardia will have a, an incubation period. So you could be infected and it might not show up in your symptoms till about a week later when that stuff uh, really kicks in. Looking at this stuff, I didn't see anything that he did that I would have done any differently. You know, sometimes you just catch a stroke of bad luck. So because of whatever uh, Benji caught out there, he decides to, to call it quits, which is probably in that case, probably the right call because with those, uh, with those pathogens, I mean, you can't, you just can't function out there in the woods and you would waste away. So I agree with this call there. It'd be a tough one to make. Um, and unfortunately sometimes stuff just happens, but on the boat ride out, Benji said something to the effect that it's not what happens to us that matters, but how we handle it. And that's something that seems very simple, but is a very powerful thing, um, not only for this situation, but for everyday life, because we, it is absolutely true. We cannot help. We can't control what happens to us, only how we respond to it. Whatever's going to happen is going to happen. That's a given. Life is always going to throw us unexpected difficulties. What matters is whether we allow those difficulties to defeat us or we use them to make us stronger. All right, let me know what you guys want to see for next Thursday's video and I'll try to put something together. So with that, we'll see you on the next one.